okay. Good evening, everybody, and you're very welcome to uh, our Facebook um, lockdown conversations um, here on our ADCI um, page. It's great um, to be here tonight doing something maybe a little bit different in these times when we're all locked down in, uh, in our houses and uh, no place to go and no drama happening and nothing going on. So uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome our first uh, guest for our lockdown series, Leitrim Man, uh, director, writer, uh, and all round actor and entertainer, <laughs> uh, Mr. Seamus O'Rourke. Seamus, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Paddy. I was wondering how long the intro would uh, take there, but uh, yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, just everyone out there that's uh, that's um, uh, watching us live here on Facebook this evening, and just to say to you, uh, look, we love uh, your comments, where you're from, what uh, festival you're from, or maybe what drama group you're from, or whatever. Stick it in the comments, and uh, just to see uh, who all we have on with us here to, tonight. Okay, so make uh, about ourselves. yeah, make us feel good. Make make us feel that we're not we're not working in vain here. Uh, so Seamus, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you on for the first of these uh, in very 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 strange times. Um, I'm the guinea pig. You're the guinea pig, Seamus. Yeah, you're the guinea pig. Uh, uh, the closest thing you could come to a pig. Ah, <laughs> uh, we not we not go that far on you. We not go that hard on you. Uh, I. Congratulations, first of all, Seamus, on your new book, uh, Standing in Gaps. It's a uh, uh, fantastic, fantastic um, uh, piece of writing. I uh, I listened to the audio book actually there recently, and um, it's it's great. It starts very early on in your life and uh, finishes <laughs> up before you got involved in uh, in, in in drama. Yes. So. Um, when did amateur drama come knocking on the door for Seamus O'Rourke or when did Seamus O'Rourke go banging on the door of amateur drama? Um, well, the the funny thing is that um, I would have, our household wouldn't, wouldn't have been a drama household, but we were very aware of <clears throat> the Carrie Gallon Community Players, which was our local group here. And uh, it was a kind of an annual pilgrimage every uh, winter to go and see the, the the local play and it was huge excitement for uh, us youngsters because um w w there wasn't a lot, lot else happening in the house so to get off to to, to carry gallon hall and and get a packet of emerald sweets to divide up between the four of us evenly evenly you had to divide them up evenly or they'd be in a row but um that was a huge treat for us and uh, I was always fascinated with just the, when you go in there at that time, uh, the curtains were always drawn, mostly because the set wouldn't be ready and the, the curtain would be bulging and they'd be hammered and, and an awful bit of going backstage. And, and in, in lots of ways, we, of course, we say now that that's very unprofessional. But back then for us, it was just a sign that there was something magical going to happen. <laughs> it was almost like one of those cartoon things where the curtain is bulging and you're wondering. And then uh, Eamon Daly, our sound man, who was uh, a very good friend of mine, he, he was um, he was sound man back back then. And that was just real to real, it would have been. And he was behind the curtain at, at the at, to the side of the hall. And it was a bit like, you know, um, uh, the Wizard of Oz in behind this curtain because you couldn't see him, but you knew that somebody was working their magic in there. So. That was the first taste for me, just going and um, witnessing all this excitement. And that was before the play even started. And of course, at that time, as youngsters, we'd have always been very um, disappointed if there was only one set. You know, we wanted, um, it, it was always called the three act play and we wanted three acts and three different sets. <laughs> and, and, and if there was the same set in the second act as there was in the first, then we'd switch off and just eat the Emerald Sweets. Um, and, um, and then every, uh, I suppose it would have been every autumn uh, at mass, it would be announced uh, of the author that the Carrie Gallon players were looking for new members. And we didn't pass any remarks on that because at the time, 
uh, amateur drama we thought some people thought was for teachers and uh, uh, people professional people and not for country egots like us um, uh, which was of course a load of nonsense but it was more um, I think country people some country people just didn't have the confidence to uh, put themselves up for the like of that and I was a very um, you're probably going to laugh at this but I was a very shy young fella back then uh, and it the thought would never enter your head that uh, you could be a, be an actor or, or be on stage but what the thought did come into my head that I would love to be involved, but that was as far as ever it went. And uh, right up until I was, um, when I was in my late teens, then football took over uh, and I was mad into sport until I realized that uh, I was barking up the wrong tree there. And uh, when I was around 24 or 25, I got a few, had been playing county football and I got a few injuries and all of a sudden I had this gap uh, um, uh, gap in my life. Um, now, county football wasn't as uh, extreme as it is now. There wasn't as much time taken up with it, but there was still a lot of time. And when that's taken away from you, or um, yeah, you have a big void to fill. And I didn't go, still didn't go looking for um, to be part of it, but I was working uh, in Carrigallon at the time as a carpenter in for a for a man who had a ban well that gets into a lot of groups yes <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly and um the strange thing was that was back in 1980 um back in 1989 and uh the Car carrie gallon had decided carrie gallon community players had decided to build a theater which was a mad uh the maddest thing you could think of at, at that time uh and it and it and it was the, one of the first theatres in, 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 in this part of the world, a proper theatre. Now, I didn't know anything about the theatre. I knew that there was a, a few Foss boys uh, sleeping up the back of the hall, and, and um, I didn't know exactly what they were supposed to be doing. But I was asked to um, borrow my boss's van and bring down a load of seats for this new theatre. And I remember we went up and we had a uh, we brought these secondhand seats from, I think it was Drogheda, a cinema in Drogheda, and we brought them down and we went in the back door of the theatre and the concrete was already in for the seating, which, you know, there's a lot of retractable seating now, but this was concrete in the round big steps and it looked, it all, it looked like, you know, one of these uh, Greek amphitheatres. And I, I have to say, and I, I keep saying this, but it's because it's true. I was really taken aback when I saw this, when I walked into this building and the stage was already there on the low level and we walked in at the higher level and I just, I took my breath away. And I had never been on stage before. I had never, um, I, I didn't know what, uh, wh whether I would be any good or not or any of that, but it was just, this place done something for me, and um, and around the same time, uh, Gus Ward, the great Gus Ward, uh, who's a great my great friend and mentor, um, he was trying to uh, coordinate the opening of the theatre with a new production because the group, the Carrigallon Community Players, had lulled a little bit. Like lots of groups, we were at a kind of a changeover. There were lots of people. Father Patsy Young had left. Uh, good few years before that and there was older older members of the group who were uh, maybe a bit fed up with the circuit and some maybe getting ahead of their station or above their station and there was all those little things that go on in every group in the country from time to time and Gus decided that he was going to revamp the, um, the whole company and he, we did this uh, folk drama called um, oh uh, it'll come to me, but Lyland, no, no, it was no, it was um, oh god. Anyway, it'll come to me. Yeah. But um, that was our. Uh, it, it, there was a cast of about thirty-five, and he, what he Gus wanted to do was obviously to bring in um, God's Gentry was the name. Of the God's Gentry, yeah. Um, so Gus wanted to bring in lots of young people and new people, and and so around the same time he, he said to me. 
uh, you're a big strong fella. <laughs> we need someone to carry somebody in the play. Uh, and we also need help at the set and uh, your thriving skills seem okay as well. So, so as you say, uh, that was my, that was my in into, into the drama. And we rehearsed that year in the old, in the school up, uh, up the road. And, um, and there was lots of fun and crack, but I still wasn't sure what was going to happen on this momentous day when I would take to the, take to the boards. <laughs> and uh, so it, there was a big, there was a huge build up to the opening night. Now, it wasn't a good production because we were all full of uh, energy and zest and zeal and but not a clue what we were doing. Uh, so uh, the only thing that got through to us was that we had to be uh, loud and clear, and we were very loud, and very <laughs> clear, and it was and it was very clear that we were very bad. But um, and I had a few lines to say in the play, and I had to sing a little song. And I basically, you know, it was like getting ready at training to do a sprint. I just got myself ready. And when it came time to say me a few lines, I said them out and I had to sing a little bit of a song. And by the time it was finished, the song, I was tired. I put that much energy into it. <laughs> and it was, uh, anyone that was looking would say, God help this uh, poor man, Gus Ward, who thinks he's going to make a drama group out of these youngsters. But um, the adrenaline, and I knew from the first minute I I set foot on the stage that that's where I felt really at home. I felt, I felt, yeah, I, I really felt at home. And, and you caught the bug from there, Seamus. That was the that was the start of it. Oh, that was it. I was totally yeah. And and um, I <laughs> I know there's no comparison. We always I used to give out to people comparing sport and and theatre. But when I when I was playing football and when uh, I know, like, obviously, it wasn't too bad, or I wouldn't be playing with the county. But when, as a, as we went up the the ladder, or you know, we were playing championship matches. When you're playing on the big pitch and the good weather and a lot at stake, I never felt comfortable going out onto that pitch because I knew I was going to be just left a little bit wanton. But from the minute I walked out on the stage, I felt this is me. I'm gonna I'm gonna be all right here. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be exposed. And I think, you know, that's that's our biggest fear as humans is that we're going to be left somewhere that we're going to be exposed and look look silly. Now we did look silly and, and looked silly. I did look silly for a good few years until I started to learn a few, started to listen to a few adjudicators and learn a few things. But but the enthusiasm is is was there, and that's obviously really important. And then the willingness to uh, take on board what people are telling you is good help. Yeah. And then uh, you didn't bring that show on the circuit. That show didn't go on the circuit. Did oh, it? we did. Oh, we you did. did. Yeah. We, yeah. we went in under the radar and we came out under the radar. I remember it, uh, I remember it being on up here in Sherbrooke, but uh, I couldn't remember whether it was the circuit or not, because we had the Father Patsy connection with Carrie Gallon at the time, and whatever was on in Carrie Gallon was probably on in Sherbrooke. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and loads of other places as well, Glen Farn and, and, and shared all around the place. Uh, well, yeah, sorry, that was, but that was the start of not just my uh, my first start, but uh, lots of people like Brian Riley and um, I don't think anyone has heard of Brian Riley, but he's he's one of those lesser actors down here in Carrie Gallon, and uh, <laughs> but lots of people started at the same time, uh, so it was it was exciting times for for the uh, what was now the Corn Mill because we opened our theatre with that show. Yeah, and uh, and then of course the Cornell Theatre Group. Then that that's where you where yeah. you kicked off from there. Yeah. What, what was your first show then to do on the circuit? So that was like going to Championship Football then for you. It was the same. Uh, so yeah, so uh, <laughs> you laugh at this because um, so we did that, and and as I say, I had a, a little bit part five minutes. Um, there was one night, the second half, we were supposed to be on stage and the second half had started and we had forgot, we were down the back eating buns. <laughs> and so that's how professional we were. But um, but the next year, uh, rightly or wrongly, 
Gus decided to do a revival of um, uh, Carrie Gallon's greatest moment, which was The Honey Spike by Brian McMahon, which you played in yourself. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, the Carrie Gallon players had done a fantastic um, production. Uh, uh, there was a fantastic production of this play in 1975. And I think Gus uh decided and, and, and rightly so just that he would get something that he knew would work that he would get in audiences that would um and would still have a big cast uh he decided to go with go with it uh and i ended up playing the lead role uh, martin claffey in in that production but um again uh <laughs> um there was a lot of uh, energy and, and not a lot else. It wasn't subtle by any manner or means. Um, uh, and, but it was, it was all a learning curve. Yeah. And I, I remember that year meeting uh, the great Patsy Kroll. Um, and it was the only place, uh, it was, he was one man who, who always, uh, he was really looking out to, to give people a little bit of encouragement and uh, he actually created an award that year that it was a kind of an adjudicator's award, but he created an extra one to give to me because he said there was a little bit of potential there. Now, it wasn't, uh, uh, but he, it, it was something. And I tell you what, and he actually said it on the night, Lord of Mercy him, he said, you know, this might just give someone a little bit of encouragement to keep going. And, and it did, and, and if, and like we've all won awards at drama, but that was the that was the best one for me because it was somebody telling you you're not totally crap at this, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is, and and that's the most important thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Patsy, Patsy was one of our past chairman. Patsy was chairman in the ADCI at one stage as well, so he was Patsy Cole. Yeah, well, so, he, was, uh, he was a great um, theatre man, and and strangely. Uh, when I wrote my first play and brought it on the circuit, um, Patsy was the first man to to have the uh, pardon the expression, but to have the balls to say, "Yeah, uh, let's go with this," because we had we had met a few people who who were afraid to because it was uh, wrote by one of the group. They were a little bit apprehensive, and um, they they didn't want to be the first person to to give it the thumbs up in case it, it turned out to be a flop and yeah in fairness to patsy he had the um he had the confidence in his own belief and his own ability and his own beliefs beliefs that uh, he he uh, he gave us a thumbs up somewhere along the line and, and again that was a, a great boost of confidence for somebody starting out writing and that would have been dig same was it that was dig yeah yeah dig yeah and so that that was uh that was a great great production um and then, so you went on. Then, um, Carrie Gallen then performed uh, the Trap Family as well, and 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 Stay yeah, and yeah. Um, I, I, there was for years the Corn Mill was one of many companies, uh, including Kilmeane and and lots of lit companies that had never won in All Ireland. You know, there was um, there was a huge swing in amateur drama back in the in the in the mid 80s uh sorry in the in the mid 90s i suppose yeah, 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 mid um, yeah. because in the 70s and 80s there was a lot of a, what we call uh we may call abstract theater or, or um just um i suppose what we also call more difficult stuff there was a lot of marit sad and and uh, really um uh, and, and not stuff that an, uh, an audience would enjoy that much but but really a really high quality and then for some strange reason um it that it started to turn and and all of a sudden uh the, the more folk dramas and the john b's and the and the tom murphy's and all these writers started to be acknowledged um in the amateur scene and and uh and escorty were the first kind of group doing that sort of play to break make a breakthrough and then we came along after that and then kill me and all these other um uh so it's it's, it's a an interesting 
thing to look back at where the amateur drama was. And I'm not saying that it's, uh, I'm not saying that it, it made a, it changed for the better. I'm just saying that there was a, a, a change and it's now more an audience driven, uh, um, the plays are more audience driven than, than they used to be back then. Yeah. And then, um, of course, then you had the, the, the different venues, uh, the challenge of moving around the different venues. This is where the man with the van came in and the carpenter, uh, the challenge of moving around the different uh, venues all around the country and then trying to qualify for an All-Ireland. So that was like, uh, as I said earlier to you, that was a wee bit like the championship football. Yeah. And, and if, if you ask me um, what they miss most about uh, the amateur drama scene it's it's getting into a van uh, in Carrigallon at half eight in the morning of a uh, in February and heading to Kilty Clower or or Shercock or, or where, wherever it would be and uh, Tubercurry or whatever uh, with a with a van load of stuff and and the more problems the better because you know we, we had a great crew and the Finnegan's and uh, Philip and and lot I'm not name people but there was a we had a great crew and so we asked for no better fun than something to be in the way or for the hall not to be open because we wouldn't wait for a key we'd have cut a hole in the wall or broke through or started a digger and took the roof off that we do anything to get up this uh, set and I think that spirit is still in the amateur scene it's great I love it yeah, yeah and I suppose it's a, it's a lot of the buzz of being on the circuit you know and it's a, it's a lot yeah. of uh, the problem is it also coincided with mm. spoken about 40 fags a day and uh, 20 cups of tea and all that. <laughs> oh, and ham sandwiches and the whole crack, you know. And all the sandwiches that were supposed to be for the cast, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, Seamus, it was on so the it, it, fantastic success in, in Corn Mill uh, to win in uh, the first all Ireland in that loan. Yeah. Um, uh, back in I just can't put a year on it now 80, um, I think it was uh, sorry 98 yeah 98 and that was with the Belfry with Belfry yeah and you yeah. were in that Seamus I was yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was I was playing midfield in that yeah I, I and, was uh, and Ronan yourself and Ronan and, and... no no Ronan wasn't in no, it no was it not Ronan no no, Ronan was involved. With Raymond Hackett, sorry, Raymond Hackett. Yeah, Raymond Hackett. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, it had a, lo a lovely cast and it's a beautiful play. And um, we went to three or four uh, festivals and they told us it was cast completely wrong and I was too young to play RT. Yeah. And um, there, was a, there was a lot of things. But we, we got through to the All Ireland on the last two, on the last two festivals, which yeah. is fantastic. The sweetest way. It's a bit like Cabin last Saturday, you know. We, we just... <laughs> left it till the last minute. Yeah, Killian McGuinness came up and took a 45 in the last minute. We got um so Killian McGuinness was directing that show. And um and then we went we went to Atlone, and of course we've we've we we were in Atlone for years and years and all this bad story. And 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 usually by the time we'd get to Atlone, there was a man there, I can't think of his name, he was the caretaker, and he'd always greet us with with um Something like you know, oh, the crowd that was here last night were amazing. Oh, they're going to win it, and and you were left in no doubt that you you were you weren't going to win before you even kicked the ball, as I say. So, but we went that year uh, in '88, and we were on the second night, and of course nobody gave us uh, give us any chance. But lo and behold, uh, yeah, we won. And don't ask me anything about what happened after that because uh, I wasn't seen for about three days. <laughs> 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 fantastic stuff fantastic stuff but um so so i, I suppose if i was to ask you Seamus, all great memories and great and great nights and you know you had some very tough characters to play over the years like in 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 shining city i remember that was a, a really really tough performance but probably one that that st stands out for me in your amateur days was the the part you played of pato in uh, in the beauty queen i i uh, the, the, i remember seeing it here in shark and then seeing it at loan and that letter i i personally in my own opinion i i never seen it done as well since and it was it's a memory that always stands out with me when i'm thinking back but have you memories of of, of nights that are on the stage that 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 really ticked all the boxes for you um yeah 
yeah, there was there was there was loads. Um, uh, I always remember um, getting. I don't know why it was. Uh, um, I'm not sure what the play was, but we were in Shercock uh, long before the the hall was done up. So we were down in the in the dungeons, and we were. I remember coming up. Uh, it could have been. It may have been. Uh, it was something with a shovel. Now I played lots of parts with shovels in them, but um, but I remember getting being physically sick just as um, about two minutes, three minutes before I went on stage. I was just so um, so nervous. Now I'm not. I don't get that nervous you know you've seen me <laughs> before yeah. I go. um uh, once I do my yoga I'm I'm fairly calm you know but I must have missed the yoga that night but I don't know what it was and it wasn't not the, nothing to do with we hadn't been out the night before or anything but I was just uh I was really looking forward to to it and um I remember just having to head there was a I think there was an exit door they're usually locked in Shercock but I think yeah. I found a door that was that was open, and I I, uh, I managed to get outside and um, and then came back up and walked straight out on stage. Um, and I don't know why. Uh, I, I always remember that because it kind of made me or uh, made me realize how much uh, it meant to me and and how much I, I cared I cared for it. And and uh, um, and I remember a man coming up to me after he said he had been at plays all his life. Uh, in, in Shercock and uh, he loved the way I used the shovel and I was delighted. Yeah. <laughs> it was all acting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 30, 30 years of practice, yeah. But um, yeah, and, and the strange thing is that, uh, the funny thing is that the way the, the amateur scene is set up and the way I, I used to go with the set, so I'd be gone from half seven in the morning and I loved that because uh, you you get to put up you get a, you get to put up the set and then you get to act on it and and you know sometimes uh, it's been said that this actor inhabited the stage but I always felt that I was inhabiting the stage because I had put the bloody stage there or or, or was was part of putting it there so I felt really comfortable and really at home by the time the show came and um, but but moments if you're talking about moments and uh, when we did. When we did Shine and City, that uh, a fairly difficult play because mm. um, there's a scene, the middle scene, and it's my character has a more or less a 45 minute monologue. Uh, he's he's on the on the couch and he's telling his life story. So it's kind of uh, it's all down to this huge big scene. Now it's a fantastic part, and I you know you can say what you like, but. Uh, when you're in it alone, you you have your eye a little bit on lots of prizes, and one of them was, you know, it would be lovely to win uh, an acting award for this, you know, mm -hmm. because it's a great, it was a great part. Uh, and halfway through the big long scene, uh, I just couldn't think of the next line. I just, I. You were thinking of the big award. No, I wasn't. I, I, well, I wasn't, but, <laughs> but I, I I got a blank and. I didn't panic and I compare it very much like when the woman that was teaching me to swim told me to jump in at the deep end. She thought I was doing very well and I jumped in and she said, you'll come back up to the top. And I jumped in <laughs> and I, I didn't panic and I said, I'll come back up to the top. And then I felt my feet touching the bottom of the pool and I said, Jesus, <laughs> this isn't good. So I felt a bit like that that night in 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 that loan. I said, this line will come to me, you know, I'll, I'll not panic. And I, and I waited and I waited and poor Rona Ward was acting opposite me and he could see the, the fear in the eyes. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I think some some Prince Charming came and dropped the line into my mouth. But um, yeah. Uh, people don't know what the, the what's going on. The the wheels of uh, industry are really uh, churning sometimes in an actor. But anyway, that was um, yeah, exciting, great fun. Yeah, yeah and yeah. and I was also a terrible bad loser. Just in case you know, I hated um, like we we won a few times in that loan, and but I but we we lost because I. You know, for coming from a sporting background, any anywhere that wasn't first was losing. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, I'll now say it's good to take part and it's it's great and all that. But I was I was a really sore, really sore loser, and I, I'm delighted to report that I've met lots of amateurs who are really bad losers as well. Those, oh, yeah, yeah. 
it's all part of the circuit. It is, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it's not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not proud of that. I don't think. You know, I think now maybe looking back, it was a bit silly. And and the one thing I don't miss about that is the whole headspace that the the amateur scene used to take up. You know, you'd be trying to second guess adjudicators and you'd be mm -hmm. wondering who had a good show and all that sort of thing and uh it it really was it took it just took up a lot of headspace that um didn't really matter but anyway there you go yeah there you go uh, and as you said then there was there was there was other great successes for carrie gallon of course stolen child um mm. was was a success you had a big hand in that as well i was i was asked to um or <clears throat> I think it was around a time we we had done a little bit of work on the theatre and we spent a lot of money and there was a lot of uh, kind of unrest not unrest but there was a lot of people a bit worried about this huge um, this huge debt that was on the theatre and so the everyone's eyes were taken a, a little bit away from the actual drama end of it and so I was I said well I'll direct this year and um, I had I had direct a few things but. Um, I wouldn't be the. Uh, I'm a bit lazy uh, as regards uh, reading plays, you know, and I, I really um, hadn't looked very hard, but I, I, I couldn't think of, um, I couldn't think of anything uh, that I really wanted to, to get my teeth into, and and then I got a call uh, from a man who was looking for. Uh, um, he was looking for something from another play that I had recently directed, but and he said, "What are you What are you doing this year?" And I said, "I have no clue. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do." And he said, "You should do Stolen Child." And when I heard the name Stolen Child, I said, "No, we like to do uh, something a little bit more uplifting. That sounds desperate uh, uh, dribble altogether." Mm. But he said, "He said, um, and I didn't know that the play was set in in." In Cav in the in the, the around the fire in in Cav and all those years ago, uh, but he sent me on a script and um, and the minute I read it I knew that we we'd, we'd make it we could make a job of it and uh, we had a lovely we we ran it for the strange thing was then we ran it for four, uh, in total forty nights in the corn mill and we more or less paid off our debt on the theatre and everything was okay. And we, won, okay. and we won the All Ireland. <laughs> and you won the All Ireland as well, yeah. You won the All Ireland as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and and in fairness, Carl Mill have won won one since then on on the on our own and and. and uh... Oh yeah, a fantastic production, uh, a, a fantastic play, um, by Philip Doherty and and John uh, uh, Kevin McGarren. Um, mm. Ronan did an amazing job following in his father's footsteps and and brought a huge cast together and a huge technically demanding piece and and um, it was a uh, you know lots of people talk about the energy of that that play and uh, so that was again another huge high point and, yeah. and you know the funny thing is um as a as somebody who has been there and and you often wonder how will you react yourself when the glory and uh, is going to someone else because I wasn't involved in the production. I was going off doing my own thing. But but it was uh, you. It's almost a relief when you realise that oh, I'm just as happy as I was when I was involved because you won. It's it's I'm part of I'm a corn. I'm a Carrie Allen man. Corn yeah. Mill, you know, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But you, but there is a relief because you're kind of afraid. Am I the bollocks that has thinks he's above all this and and no. That was the so that's good. Yeah, and then and then of course one of your one of your uh, finest plays too then was rolled out on the one act circuit, which was Victor's Dung, uh, <laughs> which which uh, later on became a, a major success for you when you when you did make the break to 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 make this uh, your job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, didn't Vic win in All Ireland, but no, uh, no, 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 didn't. You, no. you were close. It's the most famous one to um yeah victor mcguire uh is um victor mcguire came out of me trying to give myself a part um i wrote a play called <clears throat> and this wasn't for the circuit there was uh a, i think it was my third or fourth play and it was i wrote a play called uh, right on 
uh, and I wanted to write a play about um, Honda 50s. And uh, so I thought I had a, uh, I brought a cast together with a very inex or a good few experienced, pe inexperienced people in the cast. And it was going to go, um, it was going to go on in, in the corn mill over the Christmas as a Christmas play. And, um, and the more I got into the play and, and uh, I was writing it, and I kept thinking, because I was going to direct it as well, and I kept thinking, I'd love to be in this because uh, when it comes to the time around Christmas, I'm going to be, they're all going to be up on stage and heading for pints after, and I'll be sitting down in the seats and I'll have, uh, I, I won't feel, although I wrote it, I won't feel part of it. So I said, mm -hmm. I'll write myself into it and I'll, I'll do something nice and handy that I know lots about. <laughs> I'll make myself, I'll make myself a cabin, I'll write myself in as a cabin farmer, a grumpy old whore, and there's loads of them in cabin. So, um, and, and the play wasn't, wasn't a huge success, but lots of people said, Jez, that's a great character, that Victor the Wire. And, and then the following year, I was, I remember it was in the summer and it was, I, I, I actually wanted to write a one man show, um, and I, I, and I was going to make Victor Maguire the, 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 the central character. And then the more, again, the opposite to what happened before, the more I wrote, the more I said, I'm going to be up there on the stage of my own and it's going to be no crack. And, uh, and I was after doing a one act with um, Tommy Sharkey and Charlie McGuinness. And I said, I'll write in uh, other, other characters and I'll get them to play everybody and we'll see what happens. And, and it actually sat in a drawer for six months and nobody ever... Uh, seen it and uh, we I sent it to the lads and they thought it was all right and then we went to rehearsal and um, from the minute we started magic happened so it was but I I mean we were just it was just a great mix uh, the lads were fantastic and uh, and we had great fun and still uh, up until very recently we were still having good fun with <laughs> yeah yeah and so then, um, in, in your own um, <clears throat> in your own work and, and and everything else, then you had uh, Porrick Potts and you had you brought Dig then out for a tour and yeah. loads of stuff happening and um, all very successful, Seamus. Yeah, um, I, I, it depends on how you measure success. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, successful as an as an audience enjoy enjoyed them, and I suppose yeah. that's a testament to any play that that the audience enjoy them. Well, I think if I was asked to to write a a mission statement of what I was doing for the last ten years, I think it is that I would want I wanted to bring plays um, to um, to an audience that the plays were written about, if you know what I mean. I was writing about a very, um, I was writing about rural things. I was writing about what I know. I was writing about um, the place I come from or places like it. And I wanted people of that, um, people who wouldn't normally go to theatre, I wanted them to go and see it. So in some ways, um, I suppose it, it may lack a little bit of, um, it may not have the same uh, close, uh, in 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 the bigger theater picture but it it achieved what i wanted to achieve so in, in my head um it's a success because lots of people have said you know this uh, this is doing something for me and there are people who wouldn't normally go to theater now there's a difference in that and uh, and and we can all start to go down that road of trying to pander to an audience and and you know write stuff that will get an audience in, which is a different thing. And, and if I'm honest, probably I have fallen for that a little bit at times, you know, where you, you, you try and make something um, accessible for, for your audience, as opposed to what I've just said, which is kind yeah, of, yeah. And, um, and that doesn't work because you can't please all the people all the time. But um, that, so I've, I've been doing that now for the last eight years and then that all stopped this year. Yeah, uh, you were you were ready for tour with uh, one of your good friend plays, John McManus. You've done a few of John's plays. Yeah, I mean myself and 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 John. John's much younger than me. Well, a bit younger than me. And but we're uh, he's only John's only down the road, and we obviously we're from the same place. And um, but we're not 
um, John John's a much uh, John's a fantastic writer, and uh, his his plays are 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 quite different to mine, but uh, they're just um there's a madness to john's writing that is just brilliant um and stuff like the queer uh, the, the queer land and all that um wonderful but we were going to we the, john had a great play um in Oge's bros and we were just about to do two nights in the in the rammer and uh then lockdown came and now <clears throat> I, <laughs> now it's like uh it's the whole theatre business now is, is, is a bit like being away on your holidays and coming back and seeing all your house plants are dead, you know. Yeah. Yeah. There is nothing there. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure what's coming, but I do think that theatre in general, I'm not not so much amateur theatre, but I think theatre in general might have needed a good toe up the backside. I think uh, we are all going to have to look at what we've been doing. I don't, um, I, and I don't know what that is, but I think theatre is going to change. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, there's there's far too much, <laughs> he says. I, I, I've, I've written four one-man shows, but there are far too many one-man and two-man or person shows. Uh, I think, uh, but, but that's, not, that's not my point. I think that theatre has to evolve and, and I'm not sure if we, I think there was a lot of, um, we were creating our own hype about theatre, but it wasn't as exciting as we thought it was. And, and I think um, we're going to have to have a good look at ourselves before we start giving out about the government or, or anything else. Theatre people are going to have to have a major look at, at what they're doing and, 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 and try and come up with, um, try and, and move on. Yeah. And, Now's the time because, <laughs> as I say, all the all the house plants are dead, and we're going to have to start um, watering them. Well, we're going to have to replant it. Think you know. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, during lockdown, um, uh, a job that you had lined up for this summer, anyway, you decided to write your memoir, "Standing in Gaps." Yeah. How did um, that go? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I I I have I I'm not a I mean I've written a few plays but I never um, I never had any intention of writing the book um, I don't know why uh, because if you've uh, and you've listened to the the book there was never any books and uh, uh, never any books in our house we didn't read uh, we had no interest in books <laughs> <laughs> but it was started by about. 10 years ago or eight years ago, I was on the radio and I was doing an interview just like this. And I got a call the next day from a, um, a publisher who said, you know, you should, uh, do you ever think of writing a memoir? Now, at the time, and it's only eight years ago, but um, I almost didn't know what a memoir, I, you know, I, I said, well, how do you go about that or what? And he said, well, read a few. So I couldn't be bothered reading memoirs. But I, at the time, also, self-publishing wasn't really a thing. And I thought, well, if there's a fella willing to publish me, I should get cracking at this. And I, I tried very hard to... Uh, I started and I wrote about three chapters. And it was complete rubbish, you know, because I thought he meant that people wanted to know about my life. <laughs> and the thing was, nothing happened in my life. And, and I, here I was trying to document but basically, I mean, it was genuinely, um, I was bored reading the first three chapters and that's as far as I got. And so I decided I'm not, I didn't, I was really felt uncomfortable and uh, I threw it there, but I turned what I had into a one man play called Porrick Potts Guide to Walking, you know, yeah. which uh, is a kind of, I always say it's, it's semi-biographical in that it's, it's part of my younger life without the sex, you know, and, um, but uh, then last year, again, by accident, uh, people used to ask me for uh, some of these poems and recitations that I, I, uh, I'd i be found doing on social media or oh, after, yeah, yeah. after a play or in Charlie Farley some night. And um, they'd ask me for the words of it, people, um, because people think that they could do it as well as I could. And, um, how dare they? 
<laughs> oh, double there, there. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, I said, well, do you know what I'll do? I'll throw some of these into a little booklet and I'll, um, I'll have it for when someone asks me for it, I, I give it to them. Mm. Um, and some of them had never been written down. So I put the pieces together and I uh, didn't think much more of it, but I enjoyed doing it. And then uh, I used to hate to see a blank space in the page so if there was a bit left in the page I'd write a little bit about where the poem came out of or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. and I kind of enjoyed all that and strangely um it was a great success and you know lots of people uh, have uh, bought the book and I thought well that's uh, it gave me a little confidence you know and I said maybe I'll go back to this uh this memoir yeah. but go back in a different way because I'm not so um so what I decided to do then was uh, and it's a bit like a play. If you find the structure, then you're away on it. And I decided rather than trying to document my life, which I did kind of eventually do anyway, but what I wanted, what I decided to do was to zone in on little things that happened at different points in my life. So just, so it was a kind of like a bunch of 40 short stories uh, about different times. And when I started then, I realized that I was really comfortable talking about when I was a baby. <laughs> uh because then it doesn't it's not too personal because you know um so um but once i got started then uh, and i really enjoyed doing it i i, I so i ha i was going to do it in the summer and then when lockdown came i brought it forward and i started in april and i wrote every day and the weather was lovely and i went for a walk and and i went to bed early and i got up early and i wrote again and uh and it was pure heaven and you weren't missing anything yeah 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 so uh, uh you couldn't ask for a better time to write really yeah and the fact that i had it planned was okay because you know so all was good yeah um and it's it's fantastic i had to listen to it um we'll put the link in the in the comments there uh, it's available on our website and the and the and the audio uh, book is available there too so uh what's next for seamus o'rourke uh ask tony hulahan would that be the answer no um no uh well yeah, yeah obviously um I, I i don't think anybody knows Paddy, what they're going to do soon i i would like to um I th I, i'm thinking of selling the van so that's not good right okay um, <laughs> and the reason i'm saying that is because i'm not sure if i'm going to continue and i'm being really honest here i don't really know what i'm going to do but i'm not sure i'm going to go up and down the country in, you know, uh, for much longer. But I would really, I suppose what I'd like to do now is to do maybe less, but do it better. Okay. Uh, and says you, there's lots of scope for that. But um, I, because sometimes by moving all the time and, and trying to, uh, theater got very strange, you know, from working in the Rammer, like you were really organizing a tour maybe 18 months in advance yeah, yeah and basically what you were doing was selling an idea maybe that you had for a play or something and that's not really uh great and you know i'm not too sure if theaters needed to be going so far in advance it's, a lot of it was to do with uh funding and and all that but I, I i think we need to uh tour what's good as opposed to what we have scheduled yeah <laughs> um I, I, but anyway what I'd, I'd like to do is to um, be more of an actor than a, uh, yeah, I think, I think, I think if I was doing nothing on the acting, I could get better at it and I'd like you, to get better at it. You'd be happy enough. Yeah, I would. Yeah. And someone else take down the set. Oh, but that's the bit you said you love. I know. <laughs> that, that was then, but this is now. <laughs> this is now. This is now. Well, Seamus, uh, we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you very much for coming on with us tonight. Um, there's no raffle. There's no raffle, no. Right, okay. We'll but... organise one for the next night. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just before we go, I want to thank everyone that joined us here tonight on, on our first uh, conversations. Uh, did lockdown. anyone? Oh, we did, yeah. We have a few people on there, yeah. We had a few people on there. Um, I don't think I talked for you as long uh, <clears throat> without uh, Mr. Guinness. On the job maybe but anyway uh <laughs> so strange st strange uh strange strange times seamus thank you very much for coming on with us uh, next week uh we're going to go with uh the second episode 
and we're going to welcome on uh, the Cork uh, actress Irene Kelleher, who also acted on the amateur uh, drama circuit with Kilmeen and maybe Brideview as well, and has made a big success then. <laughs> uh, you know Irene well, Seamus, I take it. Uh, you should have started with someone, you know, built up to me, but start with me and then go. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Hello, I'm sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure she'll forgive you. Yeah, anyway, um, thank you very much uh, for everyone that joined us here tonight. Uh, I want to thank the, 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 the officers of the NEC for uh, letting me go ahead and do this and, uh, and have a bit of crack and maybe bring a, a, things a wee bit different into people's homes when we have no drama. Um, as I say, we'll be back on next week again uh, with Irene. Uh, I want to thank Yvonne, who helped me with all the, the technical stuff here. She does it every day for work. So if anyone needs any streaming or anything done, you can give her a shout. Or streaming. No, no, just streaming, not streaming. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, folks, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we are going to leave it at that. And I hope to see you all next week when we have the fabulous Irene Kelleher. <laughs>